So let's start with a quick roadmap for Queensland's planning and other environmental laws. This is the first of a five-part uh, lecture series and in later lectures we'll be looking at statutory interpretation because that's a core skill that we need to be able to do. Then the essence of planning schemes, the essence of the development assessment system and finally some practical tips for taking action. So I want to approach each of these uh, lectures from different perspectives because seeing these problems from different angles actually helps us to solve disputes and is really valuable. As a lawyer working in private practice, one of the most valuable things is, you know, sometimes you act for developers, sometimes you act for government, sometimes you act for community groups and seeing those different perspectives is really helpful in solving disputes and also uh, addressing the concerns of other stakeholders. So in outline, what I want to do in this lecture is start with a problem, the redevelopment of the ABC studio at Tawong, and then we're going to ask this basic question because it's really the fundamental question that you have to frame and answer to uh, essentially decide how the planning system applies to the proposed development or any environmental law generally. The broad question, leaving aside the you know, legal terms, but the broad question you, you always have is does the proposed development comply with the law and if not, what steps need to be taken to either stop it or to make it comply. And obviously stop it and make it comply are two different perspectives. You might want to stop it if you're a neighbour, and but if you're the proponent, you want to basically make it comply. So you want to find out, does the law apply to me, uh, uh, this proposed development? If so, can I just do it automatically? Do I need any approvals? Uh, and if I am going to apply for an approval, am I likely to gain it? Um, because making an application can be very expensive uh, it can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to get engineering reports, architecture reports. You don't want to spend that money if you don't think it, you're likely to get an approval. So in framing your application, you typically frame it around what is likely to be approved. So within that question, um, what laws regulate the activity is a key issue and also um, what are the applications that you, you need. So in this introductory lecture, I really want to think about how we conceptualise, think about environmental law generally, not just the planning system. I know we're here talking about the planning system, but I see it as a broader, you know, within the broader system, and um, also mention development approvals under the Planning Act. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about levels of government. I'm going to assume that we're all here, we're Australian citizens, we uh, are knowledgeable about our three main levels of government, if you're not, so I often talk with overseas students and I did a lecture about an introduction to government in Australia that you know we, we all know about Commonwealth and state governments but few people realise that there's so many local governments, you know over 500 local governments and it's typically local governments that are the key decision makers in most planning disputes. So also as a preliminary topic I just want to explain the structure that I'm going to use so a typical or traditional lecture plan goes something like this a series of you know we're dealing with an, a, um, a particular broad topic and within it there'll be a series of topics that we discuss I use problem-based learning and so for that for a lecture we start with a problem and then basically go through the topics that I might otherwise in a normal lecture but we relate it back to the problem so we're starting with the problem and then working through a series of topics then relating it back and a major re reason why I use problems in teaching is because yeah I've learned oh, like I hated being a law student I thought it was so boring <laughs> so boring hated it we go in Today we're dealing with the principles of equity. We are on page 32 of the lecture study guide, halfway down the page. The next topic is blah. And nearly died um, doing a law degree. But then I got out into practice and I found the law so interesting. And I thought, what's the, what, why is, why is the, dif what's the difference between being a law student and being a practicing lawyer? 
And I think that the major difference is when you're a practicing lawyer, you're actually solving problems. And when you're trying to solve problems, you know, what section 325 of the, you know, blah, blah, blah Act says, if that's important to your prob to solving your problem, then that gets really interesting. And, you know, the rules of evidence, the rules of procedure, all of those things, because they're about solving problems for your clients, they become interesting in that context. But you're not going to sit, you know, at home at night and, you know, read the civil procedure rules or something like that or the Planning Act. Um, but in, you know, for your job, they're really uh, interesting. So I want to stick with problems because it, I think it makes the law interesting. And yeah, also for you, you won't really understand the system until you engage with it. So uh, what I'm trying to do with these lectures is help you to um, get through the complexity um, without, um, you know, drowning. Okay, so our problem. And we're going to take the perspective that we're going to act for neighbours um, who are opposed, want to stop this project. Um, the project is the redevelopment of the old ABC site at Tuong, which uh, everyone knows. It's on Coronation Drive, five kilometres west of here. And so if we focus in, uh, this was the project that was proposed in about 2013, 2014. Uh, in 2015, it was approved by Brisbane City Council and yeah, went through um, a big uh, appeal process. And there's a short film of the proposed development, which I'm just gonna play, it goes for a minute, and it really sort of gives you a perspective on what the project looked like. So you know that the old ABC studio site um, was a, basically, there was a cancer cluster there and the staff became really concerned about it, and so ABC moved. Um, from that site and basically the site has set, sat vacant but it's a massive site in you know in, in a city location right on the riverfront so it's very valuable and um, that's why essentially it's you know there's been such a delay in developing it because essentially the developer the owners want to get the maximum they can out of it and the maximum uh, that they propose or what they proposed was this Pretty amazing um, project to look at from, you know, if you're not going to live right beside it. Uh, and for the folk that were going to live right beside it, they hated it. Uh, and if you know the area, you know that it's a lot of um, very expensive real estate around there, so people with a lot of money. Uh, and uh, that's very valuable if you want to object because you can engage um, professionals to assist you in writing objections and writing submissions and then also. Uh, in any appeals. So the appeal ultimately went to our Court of Appeal and the objector, single um, objector, was represented by Danny Gore QC, who's the leading, has been the leading um, p and &E barrister for two decades in Queensland. Uh, I'm not sure what Danny charges a day, but I would, I would be surprised if it was less than $12,000. So Danny did, I think, the trial in the PE court and the um, appeal. So you'd be looking at, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of, because you pay for preparation as well as their appearance. You're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees uh, to run an appeal, or to run the, the appeal in this case. And there was a really significant decision that followed it. But our 
um, problem is let's just put aside that there's already been a case about it and just try and unpack how it fits within the regulatory system and why planning is relevant to it. So how we think about the environmental legal system or conceptualise it is really important um, because there's, a, there's, way, there's many ways you can sort of um, get it wrong and um, what I'd like to do now is just give you a quick roadmap of Queensland's environmental legal system to basically unpack what laws apply to the proposal, who are the key decision makers and what are the opportunities um, that we have for objections. So if we think about the environmental legal system, I think that there's three, well particularly the first two, broad ways to think about it that are really common. So the first is government silos and uh, second is traditional descriptive categories such as pollution and I'm going to talk to you about a jigsaw approach. So government silos, let's just unpack that. Basically if you go to any website uh, or, or government department website, you'll find a wealth of information on the laws that they administer but very little on any other laws. So uh, the websites are great once you know you've got to go to them, but actually knowing where you've got to go is um, a big obstacle that people, particularly if you're new to the system, uh, have. So, um, like the planning department uh, has a really useful... Am I being... Too kind there, really useful. A useful website. I actually find it fairly clunky. Like I find it difficult to find relevant documents. Like I go looking for things like the development assessment rules and I can't find a way to actually get, you know, they've got their resources list, but you end up getting a whole heap of documents with it and they, they bring up the superseded versions and it's, I find it very unuser friendly. Um, and like the public information that's there is like a half an hour talk from Jesse Chadwick talking to a camera about different sections and there doesn't seem to be much effort in terms of good audio visual things or the like. So I don't find it a, a terribly useful website but it's there and there's res you know, a whole heap of resources. But it's very much a silo. Uh, except that it does have an interactive, if you scroll down on this page, it has an interactive sort of link to local government websites. But on it, you won't really see, um, say, a link to, say, the Commonwealth uh, EPBC Act, or, you know, it's very much just Queensland planning and, and really even understanding the difference with mining and, you know, when does mining, you know, there's very, it's a very much a silo mentality. Um, I started my career a long time ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth and we, you know, you guys have got laptops. We had, when I was first in, in the office, we had stone tablets and we had to chip it out. So if, if um, you wanted to send a message to Brisbane, it went like via um, yeah, a little dinosaur that flew down. No, not, not quite, but um, it was a long time ago. Uh, I worked for the Department of Environment up in Townsville and um, I really appreciate why departmental silos exist because when you're working for government and someone comes and asks you about something that isn't your laws, you know, you're happy talking about your laws and <coughs> giving them, directing them to information on that, but if it's something that relates to another government department, you'll say, no, we can't talk to you about that. You've got to go and talk with, you know, whatever department is relevant or you've got to go and talk with local government or that's a Commonwealth matter. You go and talk with the Great Barrier Marine Park Authority. So you're uncomfortable talking about other department's areas of responsibility and I think the websites just really reflect that general approach. What do you guys think? So we've got some folk here working for, for government, but yes, government silos, do you find that in practice? Um, as much as anything, people go shopping for an opinion and if, if they get it from somewhere that doesn't have any responsibility for that area, then they'll run with it and it can really, can really chop you up. Okay, so people can go shopping for an opinion? Yeah, yeah that so would... Okay, that, that would surprise me because, yeah, um, generally if I'm, you know, in, in, if you're in government, the general approach is, no, we can't, you know, you've got to go and talk with and they try and direct you on. I mean, if it's a big project involving many decision makers, then they might deal with their slice of it. 
but um, perspective. Yeah. And Or something like that. There's supposed to be a wildlife corridor and then yep. so you know you've got the, you okay. know, the sewer and so, the so shopping for an opinion. Again, that's probably a symptom of the problem then that they're silos, in that you know, if you get conflicting opinions and you just run with the one you want, well that's not gonna help you when the opinion that you don't agree with, when they come knocking on your door and say, Hey, you're breaching, you know, whatever. It's so yeah. Like okay. Really yep. Yeah, you've got a point. Um, I I would say that as a member of the community, actually getting access to anybody in either lo local government or state government is becoming more and more difficult. Yep. In fact, it's just about impossible to reach people who are actually yeah, access, decision makers access, or who do the yep. policy. Access to decision who makers can it. be hard. Yes. Um, some councils do you know. You know, do have like BCC has, um, you know, a, an ability to contact their planners and you know make so councils <coughs> can do it better or worse. Mm. Uh, and then with most state government agencies, I'll be saying going in, go into your local office if you've got a particular inquiry. But often, yeah, you know, it is hard to get a straight answer. Any other questions or points about silos? I guess mine is um, sitting on the often the proponent side as a consultant. Yep. Get conflicting opinions back. Conflicting from opinions. The same department. Yep. Different divisions of the same department. Yep. Um, but also, I think <coughs> the silos mean that they don't often understand how the various legislation interacts. Yeah, that's a really good point. Often they don't understand like other bits of legislation. The problem of conflicting opinions within the same department or within the local government. Uh, that's reality. Yeah, they're often yeah. My, my concern, <coughs> having worked in that department, is that the, the Queensland planning system is not the Queensland planning system. That's <coughs> that de that website yes. does not deal with the planning system. It deals with development control. And yep. in, in a sense, it's a misrepresentation to say that the Queensland planning system is managed through that that department or through that website. It only deals with this relatively really small component of planning, largely to do with development. Okay, so it main, this website mainly deals with development control. Again, though, that's a, probably another symptom of silos, so it's reflecting on, on our point about silos. They don't even appreciate there are other forms of planning, and yep. not without going into chapter and verse, the one with the conflict between, say, natural resource management planning yep. is one that this department does not even understand the, the concept of NRM planning. Yeah, so one of the big silos that we see within the Queensland system is silos between basically mining and petroleum and then basically all other forms of development which we call planning and de planning the planning system but basically there's traditionally been a big separation between mining and petroleum calcium gas assessment um, and the laws that regulate them and then the planning no, no, system. That's the obvious yeah. one that's not in there is uh, transport planning. Transport, yeah, it can be brought in somewhat with regional planning, but yeah, um, let, yeah. we can. Um, silos, I, I suppose, is a key point, uh, is a difficulty, um, but it's reality. So, yes, you just, just one observation there is that the, there's that under, uh, overarching law about never taking off uh, verbal advice. So a, an overarching <laughs> law long about a long term <coughs> professional, you were always warned not to take advice verbally from anybody in government, no matter who they were. Yeah, so, so... That's now starting to turn around and bite us in the sense that quite often they just don't want to talk to you. Yeah, my, my, my feedback to, like, in training consultants and the like is if you're given verbal advice, follow it up with an email to say, hey, thanks very much for, you know, confirming that we don't need to develop an approval for this project. Um, really appreciate your help on this point, you know, attach the plans that we discussed so that you've got a written record. You can quite easily create a written record of verbal advice is essentially what what I suggest because it, yes it is important that you document if you're you know you're a consultant you're concerned about <coughs> professional liability and being sued and negligence you should be checking and if you're told something verbally then confirm it in writing so that you can have a, a written record Which of it. Why they don't talk to you. Yep and so often you'll get really yeah good. they'll say no we can't you know it's applicant it's an applicant driven process you go and work it out. Yep. Other quick points on this?
Because I think we're in furious agreement that there are these silos and uh, we can't change that. Uh, you know, like we're not in a position to change that. So you just have to live with it. And But being aware of it is important. Yes? Uh, just the point that a lot of the like Brisbane City Council town planners, there's such a turnover there. That yep, so staff turnover is a massive issue. Yeah. Like if you're working for state government or local government or consultancies, which is again why from a consultant or a government perspective, documenting decisions is really important. But yeah, you can get... And the lack of experience of some of these people... Yep, lack of experience. Is, yeah, it's a constant absolutely. challenge for yeah. any government agency is, you know, good people tend to basically only be there a short time and then go off to the private sector. Not, not always. There are many fantastic people working for, you know, state and local governments and, uh, and often it's great uh, employer you know when you have kids and those sorts of things but yeah staff turnover is a huge challenge get so sacked. sorry we'll get sacked. or get sacked um, mm -hmm. can be uh, but yeah also uh, yeah um, but natural attrition from staff turnover I think is far more prevalent so silos are a reality we need to be aware of them um, but if you look at a textbook like on environmental law, you'll see traditional categories and we commonly use them and in fact I use them like on the Queensland Law Handbook um, chapter that I write about essentially in planning environment or environmental laws. I use you know, headings like mining and planning and the like. And um, it's, they're useful as a simple description. Um, but the problem with traditional categories, so there's heaps of books on like climate change, coastal and marine laws, fisheries, and um, Philippa England's new book that I think Philippa is going to launch um, before lunch. So it, it's just come out, or is it is it available for purchase? I haven't actually seen it yet. I've seen it on some websites, but in essentially planning in Queensland, law, policy, and practice, uh, it's reflecting a, um, a common category that's used in our system, but the and I, and I really like Philippa's work and I'm going to buy a copy of the book, but the major problem with um, those traditional categories is they break down really quickly in practice. So if you think about climate change, for instance, um, versus, say, categories like biodiversity or planning, well, climate change is going to have massive impacts on biodiversity and fisheries and also massive impacts on you know, our planning system with you know, sea levels, rise, storms, those sorts of things. So they're massive cha challenges now for our planning system. So if you're thinking about, say, planning, you can't ignore climate change in all biodiversity issues. You're trying to bring in a whole range of things. So, um, and particularly um, Commonwealth, the Commonwealth laws, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, it um, is really general in its concepts and doesn't you know, you can have a planning project which triggers it, you can have a mining project which triggers it, you can have a land clearing project that triggers it, or a fishing activity that triggers it. It doesn't, categories are useful and widely used, but only at a simplistic level. So, environmental problems are just too complex and interconnected, uh, and so too are the laws that attempt to deal with them. So, traditional categories, they're widely used, so you've got to be aware of them, and you can even use them, but just be wary of them. This is, I've said an alternative, I was thinking about the right word to use. I don't suggest it really as an alternative, as a sort of adjunct is maybe the better word, because I think you've got to basically be aware of si the silo approach. You've got to be aware of the traditional categories, because they're so widely used. But what I use is what I call a jigsaw approach, and you've got to there's a big handout that you've got with this diagram on it. Um, this is the way that essentially I like to think about essentially problem solving in the law for environmental issues and including planning. So think of the law like a jigsaw and you basically need to identify the pieces. The categories don't matter. It's, you know, if you say you're acting for a developer, your task is to identify what are the relevant laws that apply and who are the relevant decision makers. It doesn't matter what, if you're going to call it, you know, it might be a, you know, an urban development project, which you would think, oh, well, that's a planning project. But then, you know, if you're right next to a Ramsar wetland um, or a, you know, World Heritage Area, you may trigger the EPBC Act, which, you know, then raises, you know, your, a need, potential need for approval for that. The same project 
in you know the centre of Brisbane CBD <coughs> isn't going to trigger the Commonwealth legislation. Um, so something like our development out at Tuong isn't going to trigger the EPBC Act, but um, it's still important to be aware of those things because if you're, if you're dealing with lots of different problems around the place, you need to have the flexibility <coughs> to recognise the relevant parts. If you use traditional categories, you, it's sort of apt to fall into error. Okay, so if we look at that uh, jigsaw approach, you still need some structure. So what I do is basically think of the law in four levels. So international law, national laws, Commonwealth laws, state laws, and then the common law. So a hierarchy. And then I list each of the bits of legislation or the like in alphabetical order, just to avoid categories. So there's still some structure. So international law, uh, you know, international policy and soft law influences Australia's domestic laws and policies in many ways. So we've got the concept of sustainable development or ecological sustainability in the Planning Act. So that, as we know, comes from essentially the international um, development of those concepts since the Brundtland Report in 1987. And at the moment, there's a big drive internationally around the sustainable development goals. And those are important principles and important goals and driving a lot of government policy at a national and even state level. But international law and policy um, isn't applicable to development on the ground generally because there's no um, international unilateral government. Things like the UN don't have power to impose obligations on countries like Australia without our consent. And international law binds Australia as a nation, but not individuals within Australia or overseas. So if you go and uh, you know, um, release a big load of cyanide into the Great Barrier Reef and you know, cause a huge pollution incident, you haven't breached the World Heritage Act. We know the GBR is a World Heritage Area. You haven't breached the World Heritage Act because there is no obligation imposed upon you under it. There's an obligation imposed on Australia to protect World Heritage Areas, but your obligation to not, say, damage the Great Barrier Reef comes from our national and state laws, not from international law. So um, international law is generally only relevant to interpret Australian laws when it's expressly incorporated in them, such as as an example, Section 17 of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act cross-references for what is a declared Ramsar wetland. It cross-references to um, the Ramsar Convention. So don't be too hung up on international law. Um, if we're looking at a project like our redevelopment at Tuong, it's pretty well not relevant. Um, if you're interested in international law, there's a series of I teach international environmental law. Um, there's a series of lectures about it um, on my website running through all of the major international treaties since 1945. More important though for us at an, on a day-to-day -day level are things like the national and state laws. So at a Commonwealth level, so this is our next tier down, the major piece of legislation relevant at a day-to-day -day level is the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. And we know, just from general knowledge, you know, famous sort of cases where the Commonwealth has played an instrumental role in stopping a big project. So everyone knows about the Tasmanian Dam case in 1983. And uh, basically, as a result of the massive win that the Commonwealth had in the Tas Dams case, there was a period of uncertainty uh, and that was largely resolved about essentially what the Commonwealth would do with the implementation of international law and how it would work with states. That was broadly resolved in 1999 with the passage of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. You can go and look at the EPBC Act website, but broadly there's nine matters of national environmental significance that development that has a significant impact on those things might trigger. So things like World Heritage Properties, Ramsar Wetlands, um, Threatened Species and the like, those things can trigger the Act. And I just, I always say be cautious about the EPBC Act because don't overemphasize it because it very rarely actually applies. There's only about 50 referrals from Queensland each year, just to put some numbers on it. There's about 50 referrals under the EPBC Act from per year, less than. 
In contrast, there's over 20,000 development applications under the planning system at a state level. So generally it's the larger projects that get referred, like big mines, like the Adani mine and the like. Um, but the, the huge amount of work and the day-to-day -day stuff is really under the state planning system when you simply look at the numbers. So the EPBC Act rarely stops or regulates development. It can still be important. You know, we know about the Travis and Dam refusal in 2009, one of the, probably the biggest decision made under the Act. And at the moment, is anyone involved in Toondah Harbour down at Cleveland? So, a number of folk. So that's a project that's essentially got the support of the state government and getting you know all a tick off at a state government level, and the fly in the ointment for this big development. Uh, you know, it, does everyone know it? It's where essentially the ferry goes across from Cleveland uh, across to North Shrubrook Island. So there's a proposal basically to um, fill in a whole heap of um, the wetlands around it, and ha it's essentially a urban development project that tags onto it the fact that it's also going to um, create a um, better um, place for the ferry to, to sort of come in. So it's essentially, yeah, getting a big swag of um, Moreton Bay and reclaiming a lot of land around that area and worth a lot of money and got um, a very um, influential developer uh, and there was some great stories last year on the ABC website about essentially the fight within the, the federal government with the federal government department saying this is clearly unacceptable that you're reclaiming a Ramsar wetland and then the minister intervening and essentially it's going through the assessment process at a Commonwealth level. So the EPBC Act uh, you know, has the potential to be important um, but it's also a very political um, decision at the end of the day and uh, it's, yeah, I wouldn't, myself, I wouldn't put money on the current minister refusing anything. Um, so, but it's there and it's, that process is running at the moment. So, does the EPBC Act apply a regulator project like the redevelopment of our ABC site? Any thoughts? No. Yeah, so if you think about the, the triggers, you know, any World Heritage Sites nearby? No. Um, Ramsar Wetlands, well Moreton Bay is, but this is well upriver, so no. Any threatened species on the site? No, it's been cleared. Um, you know, there's no obvious trigger um, for it. Um, so let's just say, yes? At what point is that <coughs> observation that there's no um, threatened species on the listed threatened species actually get tested? Because one of the, we, we've got upstream, not far from here, yep. in Long Pocket, there's a lot of development going on in Long Pocket where yep. there are listed species, certainly a particular bird. Yes. And I took the step to find out. That's a really good question. So the EPBC I, Act. Said, well, basically, yep. not, there's plenty of them elsewhere, so don't worry yeah. about it. Really good question. The EPBC Act, of the, the triggers, the really problematic ones from a developer's perspective are listed threatened species and well, migratory species, but listed threatened species, because you can easily identify where World Heritage Sites are and Ramsar wetlands, but threatened species can be anywhere. So essentially, if you're acting for a developer, you need to at least be aware of the EPBC Act, because you know a project that might be not trigger the, clearly not trigger the act in inner city, you get out on you know an area like Long Pocket and it's possible that there might be a you know an important population of a threatened species or something about the habitat there. So you need to be aware of it and potentially be getting you know a consultants report on you know flora and fauna assessment basically. We're and if we we're anything as neighbours here, so yep. questions. So the, the flora and fauna Yep, so the flora and fauna report, say you're for the developer, the flora and fauna report comes back and says no listed threatened species, you know, that no known habitat. So essentially that's your bit of documentation to say we don't need to make a referral under the EPBC Act. Um, it used to be free to make referrals and my advice to clients was always like if, if in doubt, you know, you're anything more than, you know, a medium sized development, then just take the information you've got at a state level and send it off to the Commonwealth and get your tick to say, you know, it's not a controlled action. Um, now they've added a fee to the um, application process, so it's, it's a few thousand dollars, so it's more, uh, um, you know, it's not 
as easy as saying, I'll just send it off to them to get the tick. Um, so if I was acting for the developer and we had a flora and fauna report to say, you know, no listed threatened species or any other, you know, relevant triggers, then I'd be comfortable not making a referral. Um, the risk you run if you don't make a referral is that someone runs off to the federal court and tries to get an injunction to stop you, but that's really a false, um, it, it's not a realistic threat. Going to the federal court is actually really hard. No one really does it unless you've actually got something, you know, you know as a neighbour, you're not going to risk going to the federal court where it costs if you lose. You're not going to go and do that. It co it's hard to go to court. So from a developer's perspective, um, you know, you don't... Yeah, it's, I, I wouldn't be, as a developer, if I had a flora and fauna report saying no threatened species, then I'd be comfortable to run with that. And if you, you know, someone does, you know, so you as a neighbour, you, the, the first step would be to complain to the Commonwealth Environment Department. They've got a, you know, an enforcement hotline where you can essentially send them information, say, this project is going on this land, we think there's threatened species on site, you know, you attach whatever information you've got. And if they think there's something in it, they can investigate it. And the good thing from your perspective is it doesn't cost you any money and it's, they're the ones that are responsible for it anyway. And sometimes, uh, I find the Commonwealth Environment Department fairly sleepy. Uh, it's hard to get them involved, but sometimes they do, uh, and that can be useful. You know, they can send up investigators. There's a Commonwealth, some Commonwealth staff here in Brisbane as well. So, but it's, it's hard to get them involved. But, but even if there is a threatened species, the Act talks about significant residual impact to the habitat significant populations of those things. So even yeah. if it doesn't, even if there are a small population that isn't classed as significant you, throughout you're, Queensland. You're perfectly right. The trigger requires there to be a significant impact, but then that becomes a, a pretty hard question of fact. If there's any real, if there are individuals there, it you know depends on a whole heap of factors. So me as a lawyer, I would tend to be wanting to have a consultant oh, you a report, consultant you know, to address those sorts of things. So, yeah, yeah, so I've done a lot of work, for instance, on the Adani mine, and it's an amazing project from many perspectives. Leave aside the climate change lunacy of developing, you know, the Galilee Basin, just leave that aside. <laughs> but from a threatened species perspective and the EPBC Act, it has got the largest, exactly where they want to put the mine, is the largest remaining population of this, you know, the black-throated finch species. Uh, and it's right where they want to clear. Like, it's not like it's 20 kilometres away, or it's right where they want to clear. And so it's really hard for them to address that, and they really try and duck and weave around it um, with offsets. So it can be, you know, the EPBC Act can be really significant, yes. Uh, that really reflects concept of biodiversity which is totally unrealistic and this just doesn't far as I can see appear anywhere in the legislation um, and in fact there are development um, assessments that I've seen I've got one in writing somewhere yep. where determination by the department was that well if they clear this much oh no we'll clear a little bit less and then it won't impinge on the listing yep. so they're pushing everything it's a perverse use of that categorization um, Margaret, it's lovely to see you too. I didn't see you come and sit down. So I don't want to get do diverted too much into the EPBC Act and discussion about it because it's a, it's a different topic than what we hear. I just really wanted to identify that there's these different levels and then just work through, particularly for this particular project, why this isn't really applicable for this site. Um, Okay, so we come down then to the state level and there's a whole heap of laws, but particularly have circled there the Planning Act. And Queensland, I mentioned this before, but Queensland has traditionally um, made a major distinction between the application and regulatory systems for mining, in which we'll I'll just include calcium gas and petroleum and everything else, but basically resort, the resource sector and then pretty well everything else. And the resource sector got a lot of basically favours, favouritism and easier processes and wasn't subject to local government control. Um, whereas under the, basically for everything else, so when I say planning, the planning system, 
I'm really saying everything other than basically the resource sector. The Regional Planning Interest Act 2014 has sort of blurred the distinction somewhat now um, in putting planning controls over resource projects but that traditional distinction is actually really quite fundamental and so how we get planning laws you know there's no reason why a mine for instance it is a material change of use if you're taking farmland and you're developing a coal mine it is a new use it is a material change of use of the land it could be dealt with under the development assessment system but we don't. We have a different um, uh, uh, system and appeals process. And I'm not dealing with the mining sector today. I'm really focusing on the planning. But the actual, conceptually, I just want to recognise it's, it's a completely artificial um, distinction. And essentially, essentially, it's a historical artefact. So Queensland's planning system, if we drill down into it, and we're going to look at it in more detail in the coming lecture so I won't spend long on it but basically it's got multiple layers and it comprises many large complex and related documents a um, whole heap of sort of attached documents to it I'm going to go and unpack these the development assessment rules and these sorts of things I'm going to unpack these in later lectures so I won't spend time on them now and coming down to local government planning schemes and complications of like old planning schemes um, that you have to basically look at transitional provisions for. So it's a complicated system. If we ask the question for this project, does the Planning Act apply or regulate a project like the redevelopment of the old ABC site <coughs> and along with other you know, relevant state laws? Strictly, you, are, you can only really answer that by going and looking at the planning documents and actually working through does it trigger and all of those things. That's the strict answer, but a large development like this, the simple answer is yes, clearly it's going to be caught in the planning system and it has to go undergo assessment under it. And then the question becomes, well, is it likely to be approved or not? What are the rules you apply to the assessment of it? And that's what we're going to look at essentially in later lectures with other projects. Just wanted to mention the fourth layer, which is the common law in that diagram. So the common law gives us things like native title, although there's also native title legislation now. Uh, the common law traditionally protected people and property. So you know if you, you know, if you are driving your car and you run into someone uh, and you damage their car and you know they're injured, they can potentially sue you for the damage to their car and to them and they can see you in um, negligence, uh, so common law. So it's an important part of our law, uh, and you know, you're ins you've got insurance, and so the insurer basically deals with the, you know, that, that liability issue. But the common law is, Im is important, but tends to be rarely important in an environmental context, um, because essentially the law protected people and property, but not you know, most, the environment out there isn't, you know, for me, it's not my, if it's not my property, then the common law would say I don't really have an interest in it, so I don't have what the common lawyers talk about standing to sue and those sorts of things. So the law, legislation, can override the common law, and for things like the planning system, there are rights given to objectors to make submissions and lodge objections and potentially go to court if it's an impact accessible development. So it gives us rights under the planning legislation that you don't have under the common law. Um, the common law is still there, it's part of the system, but from a planning perspective, not a big deal. Can I just wrap this up? So common law basically, yeah, not <coughs> significant for this sort of development. Can I just conclude with a couple of remarks and a summary? So there's a witch's brew of complex technical issues in basically working in this system, whether you're a regulator or a member of the community. I suggest you think of problem solving like building up a jigsaw. In broad summary, there's three basic rules for complying with the environmental law generally. Um, and these are listed in my synopsis book that's on my website. So, but basically the first is you've got to obtain and comply with any necessary li license or government approval. The second is you've got to comply with any relevant standard, including the general environmental duty. 
And thirdly, this is under the Environmental Protection Act, if unlawful material or serious environmental harm may occur, you're supposed to notify the Queensland Government administering the EP Act. They're the three rules. It's the first one. That's easiest. It's, it's, it looks the shortest. It's actually the hardest to actually work out because to under to comply with that, you've actually got got to work out what approvals you need. Because the basic way our law works in relation to regulating the environment is, the law prohibits an activity unless you've got government approval. So I'll say that again: prohibit an activity unless you've got a government approval. And in a planning context it say prohibits accessible development unless you've got a development permit. So then if you're someone who wants to develop land and you work out that what you're proposing is accessible development, then that means you've got to go and get approval to do it and then comply with the conditions of the approval. So the system forces you into an application process. So obtain and comply with any necessary license or government approval, simple to state hard to do in practice. And there's many layers to the system and including for planning and we'll look at this uh, in the coming lecture but, but basically state regional um, <coughs> provisions tend to give broad brush controls but the real detail is at the local government level so local government planning schemes are a key and yeah local governments are often key to decision makers in this whole system. And I just wanted to finish this lecture by, so I've said that this is a complicated system <coughs> and for as long as I've been involved in the planning system you hear complaints from developers and people in the community about how complex it is and successive state governments talk about the need to re reform and simplifying the system. And unfortunately there's this problem, there's a tension between making things short and simple, and, with, and lack, then lack, lacking detail, that sounds good, but it tends to give you uncertainty. Whereas if you have complex, long, and detailed things, that tends to give you more certainty. Now obviously you can have complex, long, and detailed, they're just, you know, you're completely lost. But, you know, assume that it's a well-structured document that is logical to follow, like the Brisbane City planning scheme, um, you know, <laughs> if that's logical to follow. It's a complicated document, but when you're getting down to specifying the height, the stories, the setbacks, the gross, gross floor area allowable for a development, all of those quantitative controls on development, then for a local government, like, like BCC gets about 8,000 development applications a year. Those are ones that actually come to it, let alone the thousands where people decide I don't need approval. So if you're going to assess them, if you simply had a trigger saying, if you're causing a significant impact on the environment, you must seek approval. Like, that would be simple. And that's basically what the EPBC Act does, except it specifies some triggers. But what does significant impact mean? And if you're looking at it on a local scale, you know, and your neighbour says, well, if you build four storeys, you know, on your land, that's going to have a significant impact on me well, is that right? You know, there's, and, and then how does a local government set controls like setbacks or height restrictions or if you don't have like a document that you can refer to to say in your area you're only allowed two storeys and you've got to have, you, you know, these setbacks. If you don't have that, then you've got to deal with each application individually and it just becomes this unworkable. So planning schemes like BCC's and Gold Coast, they're big and complicated. But the good thing is, if you can actually work through them, they give you a lot of certainty about what is allowed on the site and what's not. So if you're, for, if you're acting for a developer, you look at the planning scheme and it says only two storeys, it's got to have, you know, setbacks of, you know, whatever meters. If you design your development around that, and let's just say it becomes a code accessible development, you design your development around that and put in your application, you can be certain that it will be approved. If you've basically complied with the what's required by the planning scheme, you will get approval. So you can then spend 
the hundreds of thousands of dollars in doing the plans, getting the engineering reports, getting the architects reports, doing all of that stuff, then lodging the application, because you know that the endpoint is you're going to get an approval. So it's this tension. So when we look at this complicated system, don't lose heart on it. And also don't be like successive state governments where you want to come in and make it simpler. Like the, the new Planning Act has made, basically made the legislation shorter by stuffing detail into subsidiary documents. That's how it made the law simpler. But you've got all these related documents to refer to. It's not simpler. And also the reality is new planning legislation or old planning le legislation and old planning schemes never really go away because you'll always have applications that deal with old, you know, old, old developments, old planning schemes. So you've got to be aware of the old terminology as well as the new terminology. So I often like and explain it to classes like this. If you think about old planning laws and the new planning laws, it's basically like a cake where you put another layer on top. <coughs> and when you go to solve a problem, often you take a slice of that cake. So you get the old layers as well. And so while I'm going to focus on the terminology under the new legislation, you still need to be have some concept of the terminology on the old legislation, particularly if you're dealing with a planning scheme that hasn't been updated. So, yeah, in increasingly prescriptive and detailed laws and plans have the advantage of giving certainty to landholders and government, but the disadvantage of being long and complex and shorter, less prescriptive laws and plans tend to be very vague and uncertain in their operation. And if you go out into many of the regional centres, they have short planning schemes. But the reason why they have short planning schemes is they don't have the development pressure. So BCC and Gold Coast and you know other South East Queensland local governments, they have a lot of development pressure. And that's why their planning schemes are long and detailed and complicated. So, just to wrap up, what happened? Well, you can go and have a, I did a case study of it on my website, but it essentially, um, Brisbane City Council approved this. Under the planning scheme, there was a maximum allowed for this side of 15 storeys. The project was 27, 24 to 27 storeys, so three towers, massively over what the planning scheme actually allowed. And it went before the Planning and Environment Court. Um, uh, sorry, it was approved by Brisbane City Council. Judge Rackerman heard the appeal uh, in the Planning and Environment Court. He um, um, dismissed the objections to it. Uh, so it was, a, it was a submitter appeal. He dismissed the objections and um, would grant the development approval for this development. The, one of the objectors appealed and won uh, in the Court of Appeal. And the Court of Appeal said, under the old planning system, that essentially there, there wasn't the public interest was defined by the, um, the planning scheme and that therefore there wasn't the broad discretion um, on the um, Planning and Environment Court to approve something that was so uh, inconsistent with the planning scheme. Um, fast forward on from that and the new system doesn't have the same tests, but the decision in that case, Bell and Brisbane City Council, uh, is still an important um, I, I sort of think of it like a, a ghost in the background now because the, the current Planning Environment Court judges sort of refer to it and then dismiss it but then it's sort of like the ghost that's there because um, Judge Rackerman is a fantastic um, p and &E judge. He's been you know, the leading um, p and &E judge, very well respected so it was a big sort of slap on the knuckles to him to be overturned. Um, it's a bit like a ghost that's there in the background. Okay, so to wrap up um, this problem, development of Tawong, we th and when we think about the laws, conceptualising it, um, we've talked about silos, talked about different ways of thinking about it. Ultimately, we see that for a project like this, planning framework is really important. So that diagram I've given you is intended as a roadmap. And think of the law you know, in a jigsaw. Some key takeaway points is three main ways of thinking about the law and they're not mutually exclusive. So, you know, silos are a reality. You've just got to live with them. Um, traditional descriptive categories are widely used. The jigsaw approach that I've um, presented is, 
you know, just an idea that you might find helpful or not. Okay, be wary of silos and categories. They're widely used but apt to mislead. Um, the Development Assessment System in the Planning Act provides a central part of this whole system for most projects. There's over 20,000 applications in Queensland each year. And yeah, there's a trade-off between long, complex and detailed laws and plans. They're more difficult to use but tend to give more certainty.